great to be back at in-person events. Remember those? So much fun. And one of my skydiving teammates here in the audience, Beck, from our, our famously not very famous nationals team, Sen Noobs, pre-pandemic. -pre yeah, so I'm, I'm here to talk about um, this psychedelics revolution that's happening in medicine right now. So I don't know if probably some people in the room have read Michael Pollan's book, How to Change Your Mind. Probably a bunch of people here are familiar with psychedelics and some of the trials that are going on. Um, so I've been studying psychedelics for a couple of decades now. Um, I've even been doing it professionally for a few years. Um, I, I, my background's in chemistry. I've, I've worked in drug development on uh, things like ALS treatments. Um, but I've studied psychoactive substances for quite a long time in, in all seriousness. So I'll tell you tonight about some of the work we're doing at Silo. So, Sorry, Sammy. <laughs> you're right. So I, I'm a lapsed academic. I actually used to work with Delara and Isabel at the Lambert Initiatives doing cannabinoid science. Um, and now I've jumped into this startup with Josh Isman, who's, who's a CEO and co-founder up the back there. And we're trying to develop new treatments for depression because the current treatments aren't very good. So there's this huge unmet need um, for new antidepressants with new mechanisms of action. Um, several, hundred pe several hundred million people suffer from depression. Um, we know that COVID has had a, a massively compounding impact on this. A lot of people take SSRIs or, or tricyclic antidepressants. I'm sure statistically a whole bunch of people on, in this room are on them right now. And they're not very good. They come with a host of side effects, um, you know, loss of libido, weight gain, all sorts of other, other problems, and they're not even very effective. And this is really what's driven this uh, huge amount of interest in this sort of psychedelics renaissance. So uh, a lot of the early work um, in this field goes back decades, and then prohibition came along and shut a lot of it down for very um, unscientific reasons. And in the last decade or so, a few really pioneering researchers have started looking at the effects of psychedelics in a number of different conditions. So this is um, some pretty famous data from Robin Carhart Harris, uh, who was at Imperial uh, before joining UCSF. So he was looking at the effects in depressed people um, on this depression rating scale following treatment with um, a single dose of psilocybin, so the active ingredient in magic mushrooms. And what he found was that depression scores following a single acute treatment um, decreased rapidly within a week and that these effects were sustained for a number of months after treatments. So this is quite different to your typical antidepressants that have a latency of, a, of action and um, you know, need to be taken every day. So this got a lot of people in the field, you know, quite serious, dry and conservative psychiatrists really interested in the, the potential applications of these compounds. Um, and if you look at the last few years, uh, psychedelic medicine has really taken off. So there are actually more than 100 trials going on around the world at this point. Um, some of these are small, some of them are, are a little bit larger, and they're using traditional psychedelics um, like psilocybin and LSD, but also these sort of um, non-classical psychedelics like MDMA and LSD. So a burgeoning area of research. Um, the conditions that are being investigated range from um, depression to anxiety, end-of-life anxiety, um, eating disorders are, are being explored right now, so it seems to be quite a, a broad therapeutic application. Uh, obviously, a lot of this has, has happened since 2021. There's been a huge amount of investment, both um, academically and privately. There are now a number of companies, mostly focused on psilocybin, but also on other compounds. Um, Australia's own federal government committed $15 million through a, a medical research fund to fund trials in psychedelics, which is, is quite progressive for quite a conservative government. Um, and, and there's been a huge amount of investment as a result uh, in the private world. So people are really driven by sort of a lot of optimism in this space because of the profound impact this could have. Um, if you can believe it, uh, we've been fundraising at the moment. There are actually more than a dozen psychedelics VCs, so venture capitalists that only invest in psychedelic industries, which is um, quite phenomenal to me. So we should probably kick things off with a little bit of history. Um, the Western world, Western medicine, discovered psychedelics in 1943. Um, and this was when Albert Hoffman, a chemist working at um, Sandoz Laboratories in Basel in Switzerland in the, the war years, had been making a series of um, ergot derivatives. So um, ergot derivatives, ergot's a, rye, a, a, a fungus that grows on rye, parasitizes it, and alkaloids from this fungus have been used medically for a long time and there's uh, documented uses of them historically. Derivatives are still used um, in labour, uh, um, even in the modern age, for sort of inducing labour and controlling contractions and other things. So he was taking this alkaloid, clicking on a bunch of different amines to make a series of amides, and the 25th member of that series um, became lysergic acid, or lysergic sour in the German, diethylamide, uh, LSD-25. Um, it was sort of, it was actually first synthesized in 1938. He sort of discarded it, didn't really think much of it. Went back on a, a bit of a whim to reinvestigate it in 43. Um, accidentally touched a small amount of the crystal to his mouth somehow, it's believed. This is tartrate crystal that he made, and he had 
the world's sort of first Western trip and kind of freaked him out. Um, as you can see here, in a dreamlike state with eyes closed, I perceived an uninterrupted stream of fantastic pictures, extraordinary shapes with intense kaleidoscopic play of colors. The external world became changed as in a dream. Objects assumed unusual dimensions and colors became more glowing. Even self-perception and the sense of time were changed. After a few hours, the not unpleasant inebriation disappeared. What had caused this condition? So imagine going to work, you're just a chemist, a pretty you know, dry conservative chemist like myself, and you, on your way home, start tripping out. You probably think you've gone crazy. Um, so he did what any good scientist would do, and he repeated the experiment a few days later. So, so we celebrate this now as Bicycle Day. The reason it's Bicycle Day is because it was the war years and a lot of automation was, uh, a lot of uh, automotive transport was controlled and restricted, so we only had a bicycle to move around. So thinking that maybe it was this compound he'd been working with a few days earlier, he set up a very sensible experiment. He decided he would dose himself with 250 micrograms, you know, a quarter of a milligram, about a quarter of a grain of sand, being, you know, the, the lowest possible dose that could be expected to have any effect. Turns out, LSD was one of the most potent substances ever discovered. That's actually a pretty average to strong dose. Um, so he's riding his bike home, absolutely tripping balls, and you know, reflects on it later and says, this self-experiment showed that LSD-25 behaved as a psychoactive substance with extraordinary properties and potency. There was, to my knowledge, no other known substance that evoked such profound psychic effects in such extremely low doses that caused such dramatic changes in human consciousness and our experience of the inner and outer world. And Sandoz went on to market this and some other psychedelics that, that I'll mention in a second as medications in the psychiatric world. And people were doing the sort of work that's happening right now. You know, this was back in the 50s uh, before Prohibition shut it down. So Hoffman remained an advocate of LSD his entire life. Um, drugs can't be that bad for you because he continued to use the substance. He died at 102, pretty healthy, very active and fit. So um, LSD is certainly not, not too bad for you acutely. Uh, things get more interesting when this investment banker, Robert Gordon Wasson, uh, he's a bit mycophobic as many people in sort of Western cultures are, scared of mushrooms, but his wife happened to be Russian. Um, and so she'd grown up foraging for mushrooms and he'd had exchanges with Richard Evan Schultz, the, the famous um, ethnobotanist who'd written about how prior to um, the arrival of the Spanish in Central America, uh, Mesoamerican peoples would use mushrooms. And this is sort of evident in a lot of the artwork. So you can see these sort of one foot tall mushroom stones that are found throughout Mesoamerica across cultures. And the sort of hunch there was that maybe there's some mushrooms that are uh, pretty interesting pharmacologically or associated with various rituals. So he went down to Mexico in, in 1955 and he actually encountered Maria Sabina, shown here on the left. So she's a, a curandera. Um, a sort of healer uh, in the Mazatec culture. And so he stayed there in Oaxaca one night and became the first uh, Western person to, at least the person who receives credit for trying um, what we now know as magic mushrooms. Uh, and it turns out a whole bunch of fungi across the world produce psilocybin, it's just the Western world had lost that knowledge uh, through sort of this, the Spanish conquest. And then things get really exciting with Alexander Shulgin, who's maybe, you know, I've got this friend who says, uh, there are two types of chemists, mild and wild. So Shulgin is definitely of the wild variety. Um, he was following all this research pretty closely. He was connected to a lot of these other chemists. He decided to look at mescaline. So mescaline is, it's not working on this screen. Mescaline is the compound in the top left. So this is the compound that's found in peyote that's re responsible for its psychedelic effects. Um, he was working for Dow Chemical at the time. So they'd given him a pretty long leash because he invented a very famous insecticide called Zectran, made Dow a lot of money. He decided he was going to start exploring phenethylamines and modifying them, and Dow said, that's okay, I guess. And he started looking at specific structural changes. So in TMA, if you introduce this little methyl group that I've colored in pink um, to mescaline, you increase the sort of duration and the potency of the compound, and that's because the body can't break it down as well. If you shuffle those methoxy groups on the ring around, you actually get a more optimal configuration in the 245 position of TMA2. So 20 milligrams is fully psychedelic, lasts for about 12 hours, a pretty, pretty reasonable psychedelic drug. And if you get really crazy, you can modify the four position and put just about anything you want there that's of a certain size and electron density. And you get things like DOB, which is uh, fully potent at one milligram and lasts for about 30 hours. So one of the longest lived psychedelic substances known. So like any good scientist, Shulgin's doing these experiments. He's uh, publishing his research in, in Nature and other big journals. And at some point, Dow says, we'd prefer that you didn't put your affiliation on, on these papers anymore. 
Um, and that's because you'll note these are not um, EC50s or other potency measures, these are actually uh, human doses. <laughs> So Shulgin was also unique because his argument was like psychedelics don't really have very good animal models so I better test all of these on myself and my friends. Um, so he was doing a lot of systematic structure activity relationship work around psychedelics. Uh, he published his work across two volumes. He was a DEA expert witness for a number of years, really exciting guy. Uh, also died very old and in reasonably good health um, apart from sort of old age cognitive decline. Um, after doing probably more tripping than anyone else on earth I suspect. Um, and he published all of his work and of course he published Methods for Synthesis because he was a bit of a libertarian. Methods for Synthesis, Description of Effects and eventually a DA decided they didn't want him as an expert witness anymore. <laughs> shut down his lab. Um, but yeah, he, he's quite a character. I've had lunch, he died just before I moved to the States but I did get to have lunch with his wife and a number of the Shulgin people out at his property which was pretty awesome. Oh, the lab was at his house by the way after he left Dow. He just built a lab in the back of his house to do this. Pretty well. So, to date, we have sort of three main families of psychedelics. So on the left, we have phenethylamines, things like mescaline, ergolines related to LSD and a number of derivatives, and then tryptamines on the right, which includes sort of 5-methoxy-DMT, psilocybin that I've shown, um, and DMT itself. And the way these drugs have an effect is that they, to your body, look a little bit like other things that your body's already using to do different processes. So thinking about the structure of dopamine on the top left, uh, in MDMA, you introduce a little bridge between those two oxygen atoms and a little tail, uh, and you help the drug be broken down less well by the body, metabolically, and also get into the brain a little bit easier, and it starts interacting with some of the sites that dopamine interacts with. With psilocin, which is the, the active uh, metabolite of psilocybin, it's even more straightforward. So it looks a lot like this neurotransmitter called serotonin, 5-hydroxytryptamine, or 5-HT, and it starts to mess around with a whole bunch of serotonergic signaling. So, your body has all these different neurotransmitters that are constantly signaling between cells to keep your body in a state of homeostasis. Um, and there's actually a number of different endogenous molecules that are responsible for act activating these receptors. And it's just pure random chance that nature, that's come from the same you know, biochemical pool in terms of evolution, produces these exogenous molecules that have psychoactive effects in humans. It's, it's really, it's pretty remarkable. So when people talk about you know, the endocannabinoid system, how you, you have a natural signaling system for cannabis and its components, and therefore it's, it's a God-given plant, just remember you also have one for meth, for heroin, <laughs> actually for any drug you can think of, you have a natural signaling system for that drug. So let's cover a bit of neuroscience before I tell you about what we've been doing at, at Silo. So the way that these neurotransmitters work um, is by activating different parts of neurons in the brain. So Neurons are about half of the brain's cell type. There's about 86 billion neurons in the brain, according to the most uh, recent studies from 2020. Uh, that's about the same number of stars in the Milky Way galaxy, so, you know, decent number. Um, there's about the same amount of other cells, neuroglia and endothelial cells and other things. Um, each of these neurons uh, projects out a number of different axons. So these are the long sort of noodly bits, these noodly appendages. Uh, and where they meet other neurons, they form a synapse. So this is the sort of um, space between two neurons where they communicate. Each neuron will have up to 15,000 connections to other neurons. So you get into some pretty astronomical numbers. So uh, the brain in total has about a quadrillion connections, which is you know, 10 to the 15 or a, a million billion. Huge number of connections. And this is why it's such a huge complex organism, uh, organ. Sorry. So the way that this works is that um, neurons pass these sort of signals, these action potentials or voltage changes along those axons. That's associated with a number of changes, um, which includes things like dumping neurotransmitters, which are the little diamonds here, from their vesicles out into the synapse. Um, these neurotransmitters go on to activate receptors, and those receptors um, go on to signal in various ways, and then the neurotransmitter can be taken back up or destroyed, or it, de it depends on the neurotransmitter. Um, when you have this happening on a, a large scale, it looks a little bit like this. So you can see these sort of pulses of neuronal activity occurring. And you can see all the little neuronal bodies there, the cell bodies. Um, receptors are a pretty amazing thing. So this is how a cell signals from its uh, one side of a membrane. So they're embedded in this sort of uh, membrane wall. And it signals from one side to the other using a number of different mechanisms, transporters, but, but also receptors. So I was super fortunate to work with um, Brian Kabilka, who's the Nobel laureate for techniques um, to characterize the structure of receptors at Stanford. 
And we actually characterize, this is not a, a psychedelic receptor, this is actually the cannabinoid receptor, so one of the key targets from the compounds Isabel was talking about. Um, and what you can do is, is take um, cryogenic electron microscopy, so cool things down to really low temperatures, um, fire electrons at them essentially, and you collect a lot of data for a lot of these different um, ultra-cool small proteins. The proteins are suspended in a little micelle, which sort of simulates the membrane. Um, and you can actually get these nice snapshots. So these are sort of like Polaroids of a receptor in various states. So for CB1, you can see a drug here labeled FUB. So that's binding to what we call the orthoceric site. That's sort of a little pocket that the drug activates. And this leads to a propagation of changes through those, uh, those transhelical membranes that you can see in purple. And depending on this really subtle change in shape of this receptor, it signals on the other side of that membrane um, that different things should happen. So in this case, it's bound to a, a heterotrimeric, a three-component G protein, and it only interacts with a certain shape of that receptor on the other side. If you change that sh shape slightly with a different drug, um, you end up recruiting other things like beta arrestin that tell the cell to take the receptor in and destroy it. So it's this really subtle, dynamic, and very complex process, and this is happening in every cell in your body constantly with you know, hundreds of different chemical transmitters. So when a number of these people that I mentioned previously were doing their work in psychedelics, there was only the, the 5-HT receptor, it was quite new. Um, as of the last few years, we know that there are now 14 different subtypes. Um, so does anyone here get migraines? Have you ever taken a tryptan medication? So these are 5-HT1 ligands, so the various subtypes up there, there's a whole bunch of those. Um, if you've ever taken ondansetron, which is sort of an anti-nausea medication, that's a 5-HT3 targeting medication. Uh, Two-way agonists, uh, antagonists, sorry, are sometimes antipsychotics. So 5-HT is actually one of the larger families of GPCRs. The drugs targeting almost all of those receptors exist and they're, they're extremely well-known drugs that many people in this room would have taken. And then some of these things are so new, things like 5-B. 5-HT-5-B is so new that we don't have any chemical matter to explore it, so we can't really study what it does. It's probably relevant in a bunch of stuff, but we just don't know, we don't have the tools. And these receptors are distributed in different neuron populations within the brain um, and people can map them using other super cool technologies. Um, so I believe this was a, a PEP uh, positron emission tomography study um, using different traces specific for each of these um, receptors. And you can sort of map where the highest density of these receptors occur and that gives you an idea about their function. So 5-HT2A, which is thought to be the sort of primary psychedelic receptor, has this sort of unusual high density in the prefrontal cortex. And funnily enough, this is where like a lot of human you know, cognition goes on. So really complex thinking, sensory perception, a lot of other really interesting aspects of higher function. Which brings us to psychedelic drug development. So there's plenty of psychedelic drugs out there already. Um, the challenge for people working in this space now is that psilocybin is not going to be perfect for, for everyone. LSD is not going to be perfect for everyone. There are some people who will be contraindicated for using these drugs for various good reasons. Um, and generally, we can say that these drugs, like any other naturally occurring compound, are not really optimised for human use. They weren't designed for us. They've co-evolved for reasons we don't understand. So one of the big problems with all psychedelics is they hit a uh, serotonin subtype called 5-HT2B. Um, this is actually uh, a liability for the development of sort of hardening of the valves of the heart. And there have been drugs that have been pulled from the market. Things like fenfluramine were approved medicines that have been pulled because people picked up in post-marketing surveillance that you were getting cardiac valvulopathy. So maybe we can design psychedelics that, that don't do this, that are a little bit safer. Um, the other issue is that it costs a lot of money to bring drugs to market. So the cost of, of a drug approval through all of the research that um, supports it is about a billion dollars. Um, and obviously natural products can't be protected very easily with, with patents. So someone needs to come up with better drugs that are more suitable for patients that also allow a small window of exclusivity um, so that those patients can actually access those drugs because the FDA has decided to approve them. So we're working on this using a number of different techniques and it's a pretty traditional drug dev program that I've used on, on other diseases like ALS. Um, we start with design, so we're using uh, our human brains, Mark I brains and a number of computational techniques to design ligands. We then synthesize those ligands in a lab um, and at some point we choose the best ligands and we decide that we're going to test them in cells that express the receptors that we're interested in where we can get a readout um, yeah. using fluorescence or light or something else. And eventually we put them into mice to see if uh, the mice have a classic sort of psychedelic effect. So this is a pretty traditional drug screening um, cascade. And obviously everything you're learning along the way feeds back into the um, earlier parts of the program to design even better ligands. Um, 
In terms of what we know, thinking about all, these, all this structural information, this wasn't available to Shulgut and Hoffman and, and Gordon Wasson. So we now have all these sort of static snapshots and, and computational simulations of these receptors and how they work. And we can use this to sort of rationally, in a target-based way, design better drugs. So this is the 5-HT2A receptor from a pretty famous paper in, in 2020 from Brian Roth, who's a leader in this field. And you can see here they've marked in sort of blue the inactive state of the receptor, so when it's not bound by an, an activating agonist ligand, and the active state. And it's, it's this incredible amount of like single atom level, uh, functional group level, atomic detail almost, in terms of the activity of, of how drugs are affecting this. Um, so I won't go into too much detail, but you can just see that there are these very subtle shifts. So people talk about sort of drug and receptor action as like lock and key, but it's sort of more like just turning the key about, you know, three degrees and the whole door like springs open uh, for some of these activities. So these are very subtle shifts in these uh, transhelical membranes that lead to very big differences in terms of the signaling downstream. Um, and different drugs can do this in different ways to different extents. And we refer to this as ligand bias. And this is an area that's uh, sort of increasing importance, this idea that you can maybe tease out um, the analgesic effects of opiates from their addictive effects by controlling this degree of bias, like a dimmer switch. And just to show you, two, two completely different psychedelics make different contacts with different parts of that orthosteric site um, based on their structure. And this sort of goes, to ex uh, goes toward explaining why this drug on the left um, which belongs to the m -bomb class, can actually fully activate 5-HT2A. It's a known and, and potent psychedelic. Um, whereas LSD is actually a partial agonist. No matter how much you put into the system, it never fully activates the receptor. And there are going to be important clinical consequences for those kinds of effects as well. Um, so this is a little model that we made using our software to show LSD bound to um, the 5-HT2A receptor, one of the public structures. And we're using these public structures to build sort of better and better models of 5-HT2A and other receptors in order to inform uh, the design of the best sort of clinical candidates in this space. And I don't know if there'll be any sound here, um, but we work And this is great. Now we're, really uh, now we're inside the, all VR three of us are inside this orthosteric binding um, site of 5-HT2A. Right HT yeah. Yeah. <laughs> hey Daniel, <laughs> far away. So uh, far away. Here. Of Next to this fluorine atom. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Next to the fluorine atom. Yeah. Yep. It is. And I guess what we noticed was that uh, with this particular this particular compounds that I found, there were some interactions we noticed with um, the lid mechanism, the leucine two twenty eight two twenty nine lid, which oh, is a yes. really let's show that. Yes, correct. Yeah, right here on the lid, right yeah. plays an important role. I'm going to hide the surface for now. So we can see what you're talking about. Oh, you're talking about this oh, leucine residue over here, right? Yeah, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. Both leucine two twenty eight, both both amino acids two twenty eight and two twenty nine are leucines, um, and they both are part of extracellular loop number two, which is this this uh, this loop right here, extracellular loop number two. And in a lot of lysergamides like LSD. These play a role is that they sort of they they sort of have hydrophobic interaction also in this case a hydrogen bond with part of the molecule and it kind of locks the drug in there like a molecular lid which is one of the reasons why LSD in particular has a particularly long um, long trip we'll say it stays inside the receptor for a much longer time than a compound right. like psilocin which doesn't really interact with the lid. You can zoom out, you can look at the surface of the receptor based on its electrostatics, you can sort of strip away some of the surface potential and look at various amino acids and ribbons and other things. So this was super fun. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Our computational chemist Asher is a massive psychedelics nerd and really just nerded out over doing this. Um, so that's basically it. Thanks for your attention. Um, it's great to see everyone in person. Dill will be telling you a lot more about the relevant sort of clinical applications of these sorts of substances. Um, so stick around for that. <laughs> so, of course, questions. So where is Silo at right now through its journey? Um, it's a great question. We're a pretty new company. Um, we have developed a portfolio of molecules. We've got about 150 compounds developed. The majority of those are, have a desirable pharmacological profile. We've started looking at um, the sorts of pharmacokinetic properties that those drugs have um, to inform three different families uh, of targets, of, of products. And we're about to move those compounds into animal studies very shortly. So 
Yeah, it's, it's a good point actually. I forgot to mention it on the, the relevant slide. But there's this interesting idea in the field at the moment that maybe you don't need a full-blown psychedelic effect to have some of the antidepressant effects from these drugs. And Dil will talk about this a bit. Um, so there are people who are interested in drugs that might be useful sub in a sub-psychedelic sense, almost like microdosing, and still get some antidepressant benefit. Um, there's a researcher named Vince um, Polito who's doing a study at Macquarie right now to explore this. And then even further afield, um, there's companies like Delix uh, who are looking at things like non-psychedelic analogs. So thinking about what I said around um, ligand bias, this idea that maybe you can just control the receptor in such a subtle way that you get all of this um, positive neuronal change with no hallucinogenic effects whatsoever. And that obviously becomes a, a hugely relevant, um, broadly sort of marketable antidepressant with a completely new mechanism of action. So yeah, a lot of people are really, really excited about that space. Phenomenal question. A, a very long question, but a good question. Sorry, yeah. I, I like this guy. I, I probably can't repeat it, but it's around Shulgin's political views um, about drug prohibition. And so I can say to that, he published these books knowing it would probably bring him some sort of personal trouble, precisely because he wanted the, the knowledge to remain transparent and open. Um, and I'd, I'd sort of refer to a conversation that I had with Hamilton Morris recently. He's, he's a um, paid consultant to Compass, who's using a pharmaceutical approach to take these drugs to market. Um, his argument is, is essentially that by pursuing a sort of FDA approval process for these substances, even with a period of exclusivity, you know, the ultimate benefit is to everyone. The whole point of patents is that you agree with the government who grants you a patent to make that knowledge publicly available after a limited period of exclusivity. And Hamilton's argument is, you know, wouldn't you prefer that someone like him, who's an expert in this field, is providing insights to these, these companies who may not be as, in some cases at like a leadership level, may not be as scientifically informed around the, the potential for these medicines. So it's a super good point from a personal perspective. Um, I'm, I'm a libertarian myself a little bit, not like one of these, you know, wacky seasteading types that's problematic in like a Republican way. Um, but I, I do think like prohibition has a number of very serious issues. It's very racist in origin. Um, it's, you know, hasn't been highly effective. It's led to like huge amounts of personal harm. Um, and I'd probably quote Jimmy Carter, who, you know, for whatever you think of him as a president, um, is quoted, and I, I paraphrase because I can't remember the quote, but he said, you know, the, um, the penalties against possession and use of a drug should not be more detrimental to an individual than the use of the drug itself. And I think that's sort of my, my position on the whole thing.